Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age is the most recent numbered installment in the famous Dragon Quest series of role playing games from Square Enix, a series which is more or less responsible for pioneering the Japanese role playing game. So, from Final Fantasy, Earthbound, Pokemon, Persona, or Tales, many of these famous JRPG series owe a lot to Dragon Quest for setting the initial template for the genre, which of course has been improved upon over the decades. Now, having grown up in Australia, my exposure to the Dragon Quest series is fairly limited compared to, say, Final Fantasy. As Power Regions never saw the release of any mainline Dragon Quest games until Dragon Quest VIII on the PS2, which was my personal introduction to the series. For Australians, Final Fantasy XII, Kingdom Hearts II and Dragon Quest VIII all came out fairly close to each other, so it was definitely a good time to be a JRPG fan. Eventually we would see the remakes of the prior 7 games on systems like the DS, 3DS, Mobile and of course we'd eventually see Dragon Quest IX on the DS. However, Dragon Quest X was an MMO only released in Japan, so it'd be some time before we saw any new mainline home console release in the Dragon Quest series that acted as a true successor to Dragon Quest VIII. And lo and behold, finally, that's what Dragon Quest XI is. Because to be honest, Dragon Quest XI is a game that I didn't think I'd enjoy as much as I did, and I wound up getting the Platinum Trophy for it on PS4. Now I realise you can play the Nintendo Switch version with a symphonic soundtrack included, extra story content, and quality of life improvements, or you can play the Steam version with faster loading times and higher resolution, but as someone who prefers couch gaming, the PS4 version wound up doing the job for me. Plus you can pick up the PS4 version relatively cheap compared to the Switch version, which Nintendo published in the West. Now Dragon Quest XI follows the Luminary, a reincarnated hero from a small village in the mythical world of Erdria. The Luminary is destined to banish the forces of evil from the land, forces which have been contained but never vanquished for eons, and it is up to the Luminary and the colourful cast of party members that he meets along the way to retrieve the legendary Sword of Light and come face to face with an ancient evil and ultimately save the world. On his journey, the Luminary will venture into different kingdoms, combat a variety of monsters, all while trying to uncover the truth about his real parents and the many mysteries of Erdria. It's a fairly familiar and simple hero's journey story that wouldn't feel out of place in a Legend of Zelda game, and that's honestly okay, because traditionally, these simple narratives have been the bread and butter of the Dragon Quest series, as a means of immersing players in a fantastical world and letting them experience a big sweeping adventure as they run around leveling their characters up in turn-based combat. And even though the story of Dragon Quest XI features some antics involving time, I found it to be refreshing after the more convoluted storytelling in other RPGs, i.e. Kingdom Hearts. But what makes Dragon Quest XI's story endearing is through its personality, charm and presentation. You're getting a familiar story presented with incredible care and quality. There is a lot to love here if you're a long time fan of the series, with plenty of nods and callbacks to previous entries, particularly Dragon Quest III and Dragon Quest VIII. But these callbacks don't hinder your experience if you're a newcomer. Series creator Yuji Horii, Dragon Ball creator and Dragon Quest artist Akira Toriyama and composer Koichi Sugiyama are all back, allowing for Dragon Quest XI to have that classic touch to it. Yes, this means Dragon Quest XI can feel very traditional as a JRPG, especially with its tried and true turn-based combat, but it's that traditional approach that won me over. While you can move characters around in battles, fights are strictly turn-based from menus, which does allow for better strategic options. Best thing about this is that the battles in Dragon Quest XI are kept quick and accessible, keeping that addictive gameplay loop going as you can choose which of the monsters on the overworld that you want to approach for a battle, unless of course they chase after you. The only time that random battles occur in the game are when you're out sailing on this massive ship you acquire fairly early in the game. Dragon Quest XI also includes a pet power system, which gives characters these special powers which they can perform on their own or with different party members, allowing them to pull off powerful moves or to provide massive stat buffs for the party. What's great is that it doesn't take long for Dragon Quest XI to get going either, as you spend a bit of time in your hometown before setting out on your big adventure, travelling to different places and meeting charming characters, all inspired by real world places, with the localization team opting to use various accents as a means of highlighting the different corners of the world that all these characters come from. Admittedly not all the accents work in the game, but it does a great job in making the game's world feel like it's filled with different cultures, rather than everyone just having an American accent. This helps in making the main party of characters feel unique. 
While some of the characterization for characters like Serena can feel a bit flat and generic, other characters like the energetic Silvando or Regal Jade have considerable attention given to them in making them entertaining to be around, with many instances of humour definitely adding to their charm. Albeit, I can see some of the humour and content not being for everyone, like the series' trademark Puff Puff activities, even though I found them cheeky and fun. Dragon Quest XI's story is split into three acts, with each act culminating in an all-important confrontation with one of the game's antagonists, who do the job as serviceable villains, but aren't particularly memorable, as the game is more focused on developing the heroes. The first act of the game is considerably more linear than the other two, as it keeps you on a fairly straight path, introducing you to party members in different areas of the game, letting you become acquainted with the game's fun characters and addicting mechanics, such as the fantastic fun size forge, which you can use to make or improve any weapons or equipment that you're carrying. Once you hit the second act, the game takes the reins off a bit, relatively letting players choose which part of this massive world they want to head to next, with NPCs giving you fairly obvious hints about where you might want to go next. Albeit some parts of the world are going to require a higher level of experience to clear than others, and as the game doesn't do a great job of communicating how high a level some enemies are in certain areas, the recommended paths are usually the best to take, unless you want to spend your time grinding with metal slimes in order to take on some of the bosses. Earlier on in the game, I found as long as I was battling enemies at my own pace, I generally had no trouble with the bosses. It wasn't really until later in the game, especially the third act, where I found I needed to get my levels and skills up, as my team would just get floored by some bosses. The game does have a grid-based skill system, which lets you choose how you want to build your characters, where say a character like Eric can be customized to specialize in using knives, or if you want a different character to specialize in knives, Eric can focus on developing sword or boomerang skills instead. The choice is all left to the player. Of course, once you're level 99, no enemies are really going to pose a threat, as you'll have unlocked most skills anyway. Stats can also be buffed depending on the different outfits that characters are wearing too, with some outfits altering the appearance of characters in the overworld and in cutscenes. These outfits can be collected in various ways, such as through completing side quests, buying them at casinos and shops, or discovering the recipe to craft them at the fun size forge. Ultimately, Dragon Quest XI is a beautiful, nostalgic game that has an incredible amount of sheer value, content, and features to offer that I could go on and on about. Your affinity for the game will come down to how much you enjoy JRPGs, especially ones that are more traditional. I enjoyed the game a huge amount because of that traditional aspect, especially with the Akira Tori armor art style and memorable Dragon Quest music. But I can absolutely understand Dragon Quest XI not being for everyone. I found the entire Dragon Quest XI experience to be incredible, especially since I'm sure that we'll eventually see mainline Dragon Quest games move more into an action role-playing game design, much like recent Final Fantasy entries. I am going to cheat a little bit with the rating for Dragon Quest XI, as the Nintendo Switch version does add a considerable amount of content. Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age for PS4 and Steam gets a 9 out of 10 for me, while Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age S for Nintendo Switch gets a 9.5 out of 10 and a Mono's Choice Award. Guys, I hope you like this review. If you want to see more reviews just like this one, stay right here for your Mono Fix. Bye, guys.